Good evening and welcome to the American Cause Seminar. We have two very honored guests, Joyce Kaufman, the voice of Florida, South Florida, and the Honorable Congressman Alan West. Now many This is the third seminar, and let me give a little background information what the American cause is all about, insofar as its presence here at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, we have a grant from the Koch Foundation in Washington, D.C., the James Madison Institute in Tallahassee, Florida, and it's an attempt to bring back to the higher education environment a little balance on, I guess you could say, uh, civics education. And we have some literature in the back from the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. They were the presenters last week regarding civic education or the lack thereof that you're encouraged to pick up and take home with you. We also have some uh, forms to fill out. We're going to have a wrap at the end of the seminar. And we have several books that three or four people will be walking away with later this evening. Um, just very briefly, because I know you want to get to the, uh, uh, our presenters. Russell Kirk was a political scientist. He wrote a book back in the 1950s titled The Conservative Mind. And it was a seminal work on conservatism in America. And it sort of launched the conservative movement after the uh, New Deal era of the 1930s and 40s. Kirk along with uh, William F. Buckley. But Kirk was sort of the brains behind the whole operation early on. And let me give you a summary of what Russell Kirk's position, or I guess you could say articulation, about the American cause might be if he were here today. He passed away, I believe, in 1994. The American cause, according to Kirk, he, he would ask the question, what is America's mission in our age? Now he's writing this in the 90s. We're talking about Russell Kirk and his perspective in the year 2011. And you could just look at the geopolitical situation, know that things are heating up quite rapidly. Kirk would argue that it remains, this is the mission, America's mission, remains to reconcile liberty with law. The great grim tendency in our world is otherwise sometimes towards anarchy, but more commonly towards the total state whose alleged benefits delude. Kirk stated, this is no easy mission, even at home. Consider how many people who demand an enlargement of civil liberties at the same time vote for vast increase of the functions and powers of the general government. And this mission is more difficult still in the example the United States sets for the world. If we are to experience a Pax Americana, it will not be the sort of American hegemony, according to Kirk, that was attempted by Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, he might add Clinton, the Bushes, and President Obama. He said it's not a patronizing endeavor through gifts of money and of arms to conjure or intimidate all nations of the earth into submitting themselves to a vast, overwhelming Americanization wiping out other cultures and political patterns. But Kirk realized that America had a very unique world in world role in world history. He maintained that an enduring Pax Americana would be produced not by bribing and boasting, but by quiet strength, and especially by setting an example of ordered freedom that might be emulated. Kirk would maintain that we lead by example. Tacitus said the Romans created a wilderness and called it peace. We may aspire to bring peace by encouraging other nations to cultivate their own gardens, Kirk stated. And in summary, the American cause is to reconcile the claims of order and the claims of freedom to maintain in an age of ferocious ideologies and fanatic schemes, a model of justice. And he was a very strong advocate of peace through strength that, of course, President Reagan emphasized. So America, in short, in summary, according to Kirk, 
And those of you that this is your first time here, we've had lecturers from uh, former Congressman Attorney General Bill McCollum, uh, Major Harris, FAURTC, Dr. Sam Hawkins, former Commander of the United States Navy, Dr. Minson from the ISI Institute, who gave a presentation on the lack of civics education and how that is a very serious threat to our liberties and freedoms by university students not being at least exposed to alternative views. And then Francisco Gonzalez, who talked about Russell Kirk himself. So tonight, without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over. I'm going to let them do their introductions, because I can't do justice to it. I'm going to turn it over to Joyce Kaufman, who in turn will introduce the Honorable Congressman Alan West. getting very good at introducing the Honorable Congressman West, but I have to remember that he's now Congressman West and not Lieutenant Colonel Allen West. <clears throat> but I think um, for me, if I had to say which one of his titles was more impressive, I would definitely go with Lieutenant Colonel, because that is something that not only did he have to earn, he earned his uh, title as a Congressman as well, but it is something that you have to be willing to risk your life to earn. And if you look at the 435 members of Congress, I don't think many of them risk their lives to become congressmen. Right. Unless, of course, they were on the wrong side of an issue and showed up at a town hall meeting somewhere. But other than that, it's not exactly a, um, it's not exactly a risky mission anymore. It is a mission that requires a tremendous amount of fortitude, and I was listening to the description of last week's seminar, and they talked about the lack of civics. And the congressman and I have had this discussion for the last four years, how it is possible that I could ask listeners to go out into the public square and ask anyone under the age of 21, how many branches of government are there? And inevitably, out of 20 respondents, maybe two will know what the question even means, never mind how many branches of government there are. Now, if you do find that lucky two who know that there are three branches of government, they're then seldom able to articulate what they are. That's a terrifying statistic, and it may be anecdotal, but if you look at the civics quiz that's in that um, flyer that was handed out last week, you may be surprised at how little you who know how little you know. And I think that all the time there are a number of online quizzes that ask questions about the United States Constitution. And when I see the results of the quiz, I become scared for my country. Because if we don't know what we're asking the people who we elect to office to do and how they are told by that United States Constitution that they are not really allowed to do that much. It's a limiting document. As um, Congressman West said in a recent speech, it's actually the founding fathers slapping a restraining order on government more than it's anything else. And very few of the people who are in Congress today understand that. And they have taken it upon themselves to exercise some enormous latitude with the Constitution, if even to be observant of it at all, and I won't even speak about the judiciary, which in this country has lost some of its ability to distinguish what its responsibilities are. Uh, it also is supposed to be deciding when constitutionality exists and not deciding to rewrite the Constitution every time an issue comes up. So these are the problems that confront America and America's college students more than anything else, is a lack of exposure to the most important document in America, the United States Constitution, and the fact that, that many households no longer have a copy of that Constitution somewhere inside of their walls. I know you're gonna tell me that it's on your laptop or on your iPhone, but that's not quite the same as having the kind of reverence that people like me who grew up in the 50s had for that. My father, would uh, literally take the United States Constitution out of his drawer every time we were watching, in those days it was 60 Minutes, was one of the few 
programs that was on where the leaders of the country would be interviewed. And my father would start flipping and go, no, he can't do that. And he understood the limitations that were placed on, on the elected officials. Today, if you don't know that, then they can pretty much do what they want. So I'm going to introduce Congressman West, and I think um, one of the questions that I've asked him over the last six weeks is, you know, what does it really feel like when you go up to Washington and you have the United States Constitution in your breast pocket, which he always has inside of his jacket pocket, and you're seated with 434 other gentlemen and ladies who probably wouldn't know the difference between the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, or they may be able to pay a little bit of you know, attention or may, maybe describe those documents, but certainly not be in a position to quote them. As far as I know, the only congressman in my lifetime that I've ever heard quote from the United States Constitution is Congressman West, which makes him, in my opinion, a very important warrior that we in South Florida were able to send to Washington, D.C. He's also an anomaly, and that's the part that I love introducing. Here's a young man who was born in the inner city of Atlanta. His parents were patriots. His mother spent her career in the United States Marine Corps, but as a civilian. And his father served, and his brother served, and his nephew serves. So four generations living inside of inner city Atlanta, black, with a record of service like that, is something to be commended and something to be admired and also something to be emulated. And that's the part that I hope classes like this and experiences like you take from here today and you go out with, that you reassure people that this is still the American dream, that you can be born and you can achieve great things. And you may have to take a path somewhat different than other people to get to Congress, but anybody, and I don't say this nasty because we're very good friends, but if Alan West could get to Congress, anybody could get to Congress. They just have to be able to set those kinds of visions in front of them. The last thing he was thinking about when he joined the United States Army 26 years ago, 26 years ago, longer, was that someday he would be sitting in the halls of Congress. I assure you, and we've had enough conversations for me to assure you that was not his intention. When he left the Army, Lieutenant Colonel Allen West was definitely on that fast track to, as a military professional to probably be a general, and he probably would have been an amazing general. But life happened, and when Allen came back, uh, Congressman West came back to this community, he um, realized that there were other ways you can serve your country. And he changed his goal. And I watched it happen. And for those of you who don't believe in the American dream, let me tell you something. It's, it's awe-inspiring when you meet someone who sets a goal and then comes to the various people in the community and says, what do I have to do to achieve this goal? And you tell them, and they do it. Because I get asked all the time, what do I have to be, what do I have to do to be a state legislator? What do I have to do to get elected to the commission? What do I have to do to become a United States congressman? And after 30 years, I'm pretty good at giving advice. I tell them, they never do it. When Congressman West came to me and said, what do I have to do to win this election? And I told him, he went out and did everything with style. Okay. So that's the attitude that I believe a broad knowledge of why this country has that kind of opportunity available, why that's a missing piece in most universities today. There is a, a, you know, a sort of a defeatist attitude, in my opinion. And, you know, I went to college and grad school, and, and my children both went to college and grad school. And I have to tell you, in all those experiences, with, you, know, you can add up them, two, three, four, five, six, nine institutions, three of them Ivy League, I came away thinking that all the odds were against you making it in the United States of America. And that's not an attitude that we ought to be offering up in our universities today. So without further ado, the congressman from Congressional District 22, 
Lieutenant Colonel Alan West. Oh, that's, that's not necessary. I'm not too into the, uh, the podium thing. I'd rather step out here and, and talk to you. Um, I guess what we want to talk about is the American cause. And what I want to do is try to bring that to life through the experiences that I've had in my family. But I think the most important thing is you want to understand America, and, and then we're going to have a question and answer. I think that's the best way to, to run the seminar. But I think if you really want to understand the American cause, you've got to go back and understand why was America established. America is established, you look at the Declaration of Independence because there were grievances against the British Empire. And for the first time, some people believed that there was an opportunity to establish a country, establish a nation, where people, individuals could have rights and freedoms, where something called liberty was so important. And that's why they went back and they read things from uh, Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau and Montesquieu, the great writers coming from over in, uh, in Europe. They looked at this thing called classical liberalism, which talked about the elevation of the individual as a supreme entity within a nation. And so when they sat down and they wrote out the Declaration of Independence, they talked about those inalienable rights that come to a person from the creator of life, of liberty, of your pursuit of happiness. And see, that was something so different, because even when you go back and you look at the Greeks, or you look at the Romans, or you look at Britain, some of the earlier great empires, you still did not see that understanding of the individual being the preeminent entity. When you talk about Pax Romana, Pax Britannica, it really is not the same as we have come to understand what Pax Americana is. And I want to talk about that as we come to our present day. But that is what the American cause has been about. The American cause has been about a place where individuals could come and understand, America was not perfect, but it's a refinement. It's a process that you go through, where we get to the point where today we all can sit here, and truly, as Joyce talked about, you can establish goals and objectives in your life, and you can achieve them in this country. There is nothing that holds you back unless you put your own barriers upon yourself. So that really is the American cause. But that cause was something that was very challenging, very threatening, the other different types of established rule, monarchialism. And that's what we went up against when we took on King George. Because all of a sudden we were saying that the people were the entity by which power emanated from. Not this king or not this queen. And that was something revolutionary. That was something new. And a lot of people were sitting back saying, can this thing survive? I mean, you think about the fact that this little conglomeration of 13 colonies, you know, farmers, a few lawyers, ministers, what have you, took on the greatest empire the world knew at that time, the British Empire. But they had a cause. They had a belief. They had a spirit. And that was enabling them to be successful. But even still, there were more challenges to that thing called the American cause. Because not too long after, you saw what happened when the British came back. And they tried to once again quash the American dream. And in the War of 1812, as Francis Scott Key stood there and watched Fort McHenry being bombarded, and he wrote those beautiful words that ended up becoming our national anthem. And a lot of people don't understand what was going on in Fort McHenry because the British kept shelling and shelling and shelling. And artillery back at that time, they were about firing at the flag, not knowing that there were patriots that were there. Each time that flag was knocked down, they would raise right back up. Because that was a rallying cry. That was something that brought us together. That was that standard. That was that thing that George Washington talked about when he said we have national objects. We have a national character that we must protect. We must either act as a united people or say that we are not. Because if we are, protect those things that are important to us. But if we are not a united people, stop acting in farce and pretending to it. 1787, George Washington's General Orders. So it's so important that we understand the essence of who we are and what we had to fight through and struggle through through all of these different years. And see, really, the American cause was never about trying to extend this. I mean, we never thought like other great nations, great empires, 
We just want to make sure that we have this thing here that, you know, you could come and, and you could live this dream. And we could expand wrestling. And we could grow. But sooner or later, we got challenged with that. I mean, that's what the Civil War was all about. And that's what Abraham Lincoln finally had to come to understand. If we truly were a nation that talked about freedoms and liberties for all men, as it said, all men being created equal, then we had to make a hard choice within ourselves. And that's why we had the fight within the United States of America called the Civil War. That's why we had those three very important amendments that were produced, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendments. Because once again, we had to understand that the American cause, that cause of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we had to refine it. We had to make it better. That's why as we moved forward, and we saw that women were not granted those same rights, we had to refine that. But still, there were challenges. I mean, the Jim Crow laws, the things that were happening down in the South. I mean, my father grew up in some very hard times in Georgia. My grandfather prior to that. But still, everyone understood what the cause of this great nation was. And even finally, when we were challenged to recognize the fact that there was a thing out there called European nationalism, we did not want to get involved with World War I. We were truly an isolationist country at heart. But then we realized that there were threats beyond that would threaten what we were within. And we got involved in World War I. And we ended up being a light. But in being a light, there is a responsibility that you have to take up. But yet we still were not ready to take that responsibility. And like we continue to see often after many of the wars we have fought, we draw down our military. Because we don't believe in pushing ourselves and our beliefs out against other peoples. But yet there's this cycle that continues to happen. And I always tell people that if you want to really understand geopolitics, you must recognize that the world is not always Kantian. How many people have read and studied the philosophies of German social scientist Immanuel Kant? Immanuel Kant talked about a universal cosmopolitan state. He talked about a world that could come together under one political ideology. And if the world could come together under one political ideology, there would be peace. And therefore, you would have this universal cosmopolitan state. But what we must realize off time is that the world can be more Machiavellian. That's why it's so important to read a book like The Prince. Because there's always someone out there that's looking for that gap by which they can exploit. That time where they realize that they have an opportunity to elevate themselves. And that's what happened in that interlude between World War I and World War II. I mean, and we still did not want to get involved with that. But the American cause, all of a sudden, when, when this, this conflagration comes home, we realize that there is a threat. The threat back then, in that period of the late 1930s, going through the early 1940s, was Nazism. It was fascism. It was Japanese imperialism. And at the end of that period of World War II, there was a new order. There was a new person that was left standing. It was the United States of America. And we still were a recalcitrant player to step up and take over and take a, a, a truly leading role in the world. But the world needed us to be there. And so you had things like the Marshall Plan. You had General MacArthur that went and helped to rebuild Japan and get it back on the road to where it is today. But still, once again, a Machiavellian mindset took over. And you saw what happened back in 1950, when all of a sudden North Korea recognized that there was a gap to exploit. Once again, threatening what we saw as an American cause. As you talked about, that liberty that we can shine out throughout the entire world. And so we all of a sudden sent people to a faraway place that most people did not know about, and that was called Korea. And what was so interesting about Korea, as the American force got pushed all the way down to the Pusan perimeter, General, General McArthur came up with this grand plan to do an amphibious landing in Incheon. How many people recognize or remember the fact that we did not have the amphibious craft to do an amphib the amphibious landing? Because once again, as always, we broke down our military. Because it's not the American nature to want to continue to have a large military force. Because we believe that there is that time when it can be peace. 
So we had to build up the military once again. And we fought to a stalemate. And see, the interesting thing about the Korean War is that the Korean War was the first time the United States of America stopped fighting to win. And when you stop fighting to win, there are always going to be consequences. There are always going to be those uh, later collateral issues of DMZ. Or if you get involved in Vietnam, then you see what happens there. But when I was a young man in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we stopped short and we didn't finish that job. Then later on in life, you have to come back. And we can sit up here and we can argue about Iraq in 2003 or whenever, but I will tell you this. When we sat there and we watched those oil wells burning, we knew there was a matter of time, whether we would be majors, lieutenant colonels, or full colonels, we would have to come back. Because if you continue to fight and believe in a policy of limited warfare, you're going to have unending consequences. <coughs> but see, that, once again, is the nature of who we are. Because we don't want to get in this thing where we look like we are extending our will. We're trying to suppress people. Americans are not imperials. I know a lot of people throw that out there. But if you go across the world, the only thing that America's ever asked from the countries where it has served is just give us a little piece of ground where we can bury our dead and we can honor them and memorialize them. That's all we ask. Because our cause is not about extending a Pax Americana or a land grant. Our cause really is about extending a theory, a belief, an ideal, that ideal that the founding fathers brought about. Because we really do believe if everyone could come together and believe that the individual is so important, believe in liberty, believe in freedoms, believe in this constitutional republic philosophy that we have, we could have a more peaceful world. But this is what we must come to understand as we go forth into where we are today. And I will tell you this, that today I spent three hours down at the United States Southern Command down in Miami, and I got a series of classified briefings. The world is a very, very dangerous place right now. And the world is a dangerous place because it does need someone to be strong. It does need someone to be a light. It does need someone to stand up and be a deterrent against those Machiavellian actors. Because if not, they're always out there looking to see when can they rise up and exploit again. See, the American cause is about making sure that the little boy and little girl in Afghanistan can go to school and get an education. Because if you continue on to have a country where the literacy rate is 73%, 96, 97% for young girls, you're never going to have a country that could be part of that American dream. See, I remember back in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, when everything was over, and a young woman walked into our base camp with her three children, and her arm was broken, and she asked me one simple thing. My husband was killed. Will you please help me? Will you please give me medical care? See, that's the story about America that people don't ever tell. That's the story about the young men and women that go and they build schools. The young men and women that help to build clinics. The young men and women that are willing to lay down their lives for people they have never known and may never ever know again. And why? Because it traces all the way back to that thing of spreading a sense of liberty, a sense of freedom, a sense of a pursuit of happiness. We want to share what we have here in America. And we're willing to open up our country so that people can come here and take a part of that. But what we must be careful of is that we don't make who we are and what we believe in subservient to other things that can end up being counter and the antithesis of what we stand for. See, the biggest challenge that we have going forward in the United States of America is an identity crisis. As George said, if you go out there and ask 20 to 21 people, what does it mean to be an American? I guarantee you, you'll get 30 different answers. And that's going to be very hard for us as we go forward as a people, as a true culture, as a nation. See, the American cause is not about 
being selfish. The American cause is about sharing. Now, what do I see will prevent us from being able to stand up for the American cause right now? I think that we have had people that in Washington, D.C. have forgotten the foundational principles and values of this country. And if they do that, they make the decisions up there that are counter to who we are as a constitutional republic, understanding the right set principles of economic policy. You find ourselves where we have trillions of dollars of deficit spending, trillion dollars of debt. We're digging ourselves into a very, very terrible hole. We're threatening the future and legacy of our children and our grandchildren. We're allowing many different adversaries all across the world all of a sudden to sense a weakness. You know, Dr. Del Rosa, De Rosa talked about peace through strength. And that's what you have to have. It's about a business. It's about a resolve. It's about standing up. You know, 30 to 35 days ago, no one could have predicted exactly what has happened all across North Africa, all across the Middle East. But it's a way. And the world as we know it, it's going to look very different here within the next 60 to 90 days. And certainly by the end of the year, the world as we know it will not be the same world as it was in January 2011. Now, what will that world end up being? I don't know. But I will tell you this. The question that I ask, who fills the void in these countries? Because as this country got started, we did have people like Washington. We had Jefferson. We had Madison. We had Alexander Hamilton. All through history, we had great leaders. We had the Lincolns. We had the Trumans, we had the Kennedys, we had the Reagans. We had men who at critical points in time for our history, they stood up and they brought us together. But my concern is, who will be the people that step up into the, that board? Who will be the people and what do they believe is the right type of cause to stand up for? See, it's a great thing when people yearn for freedom. But if you look at history, in the Middle East and what we have seen. When the Shah was taken away, the Ayatollah came in. And we know it came from the Ayatollah. When Afghanistan, the Soviet Union departed there in 1989, the country went into the Civil War, instability, mass killing. There was a certain group that came in and said they would promise stability in civil society. And we recognized that group as a legitimate government. That group was called the Taliban. They don't share the same vision of an American cause. They don't share the same vision, really, as that of Western civilization. You know, one of the things I really like about Martin Luther, Martin Luther, with the process of Reformation, was the impetus that gave light to the importance of the individual. Because Martin Luther said that you don't need a bishop, you don't need a pope, you don't need someone to go and make intercession for you to God. Each and every one of us has a right, as an individual, to be connected and we have our own faith. And that was a huge challenge at that time. But that was the beginning of where we are today in America, where we believe in the rule of law, where we believe in individual rights and freedoms, and we must stand up for that. The American cause is not about imposing a will. The American cause is about extending an ideal. But yet, as part of the extension of that ideal, there are times when we will have to suppress the enemies that will threaten this great land and this idea of who we are. Ronald Reagan said it's so great. And Ronald Reagan took it from the New Testament in the Bible, in Matthew chapter 5 talked about America being a shining city that sits upon a hill. You think about Lighthouse Point. Think about Jupiter Inlet. Think about how lighthouses always stand out there to guide ships in troubling times so they don't crash upon the rocks. That is how America fits into the rest of the world. As a lighthouse to bring in those distressed ships at sea so that they can find safe harbor. And if the light that is the United States of America were to go out, if the light 
that is the American cause of freedom, of liberty, of the pursuit of happiness, of the respect of the individual goes out, in this world as we know it, will in turn go into a new dark age. And it will threaten the future of the legacy of our children and our grandchildren. So that's my piece. So I'm ready for any questions. I failed to mention that the um, this is being video recorded. <laughs> Sorry about that, Congressman. <laughs> um, this is going to be uploaded on the James Madison Institute website, so you're going to have quite a uh, national, international audience. And let me start, and then uh, I'll let you take back the floor and answer the questions as they arise. But I'm intrigued by your comment about the world's going to look very different within the next 60 to 90 days. And I concur in that. The geopolitical situation is really uh, destabilized and destabilizing rapidly. So just as a, from your perspective as a congressman, how has our financial debt tied the hands of the American cause in responding to these geopolitical challenges oh, that easy. confront us? That's, that's easy because uh, you know, as a young major, when you go to the United States Army Command General Staff on the Fort Leavenworth, when you do your strategic studies, they teach you about the dying theory. And the dying theory is uh, the different elements, the four elements of national power. D is diplomatic, I is informational, M is military, E is economic. economic. Your economy is part of your national power, it's part of your national strength. And when you look at the fact that here in the United States of America, that we've gotten to the point that we are borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar. And the person that is holding most of our uh, debt is a communist country. And it's a communist country to recognize one simple thing. You know, the, the problem in the United States of America, doctor, is that we operate in a lesser side of sound bites. No one thinks it's a visionary league. No one thinks in 20, 30, 40, you know, 50 year cycles. So the thing is now, all of a sudden, you had a, a country they sat back and looked at what really caused the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, it was not about us having a military confrontation. It was really about our economy overpowering their economy and causing an economic collapse. So now what happens with a country such as China, they realize this. If you are going to successfully defeat Western civilization, and definitely the United States of America, because we do have a target on our back, because we are that remaining you know, power. You defeat them economically. And through defeating them economically, then you set the stage for a subsequent military defeat. So that when we uh, have the fact that we're borrowing so much, because we are now getting to this age of the bureaucratic nanny state. And you get into the age of the bureaucratic nanny state. If you don't stick to the principles and the mandates of the Constitution, and the government starts to believe that it should take care of the American citizen from cradle to grave, then government has to grow. And that's been the failures coming out of the executive branch in the United States of America, you know, for about the past 10 to, to 15 some odd years. So now you are allowing an adversarial country to be in a position where, through their economic dominance over you, they can determine your geopolitical stage. You know, ladies and gentlemen, you're at a state of conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Okay? Last year, North Korea sunk a South Korean naval vessel, killed 40 some odd sailors. They shot 200 rounds, artillery rounds, into South Korea. Now, I was an artillery officer for two, 22 years. You shoot two rounds, errantly, that's a mistake. 200 rounds is a planned artillery bombardment. But yet, how did we respond? And we could not respond very well because guess what? You have someone that's holding your debt. So you gotta start thinking about what happens when they make a move toward Taiwan or they start to grow and uh, become a, a dominant power. The trade surplus that we have established with, with China because of CAFTA and things of that nature, now that trade surplus is not going toward the Chinese people, their standard of living. That trade surplus is going to the strategic military forces of China. And you know, I, like I said, I spent 22 years in the Army, so what I'm about to say is going to hurt my heart, but it's the truth. The means by which a nation extends its power and projects itself is not through an army. 
It's through a name. It's through the seas. And you can trace that all the way back to the Athenians, the Phoenicians, the Romans, Portuguese, Dutch, British, Spanish. It's through the open seas. And here we are in the United States of America right now. Let me tell you where we were in 1990 with naval warships. 515. As we stand right now, we have 283 warships out of the sea. That's not how you protect the sea lanes of commerce. That's how economics ties into this. You know, the fact that we have four Americans that were killed because their yacht was overtaken by pirates. And that naval vessel was not able to engage. It did not spoil the rudder. And, and if y'all don't understand, that means that there's a means, there's a tactic by which you can clip the rudder of a, of a vessel and just make it dead in the water. But they did not have the opportunity. Their orders were just to follow. And so those guys waited for the right time and they killed those individuals. So here we are again, history repeating itself. Go back to the early 1800s. One of the threats to the American cause, the Barbary pirates. And so it's just history repeating itself. But if you think about this, when we talk about the economy, Suez Canal, Panama Canal, very important choke points. The Panama Canal is going to be expanded. So Larger cargo ships are supposed to come through the Panama Canal by the year 2014, 2015. Port Everglades last year brought in $97 billion of commerce. What happens if that gets strained? That is how your economy ties into your national security. And that's one of the critical things that we must first write the economic ship of the United States of America. And then we can start to once again project our power. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, two questions. We'll be on one. Uh, first question is with uh, the recent Obama administration's action in the United Nations to veto a resolution against Israel. Do you see that it's a change in the Obama administration's uh, position on Israel? And also, how do we balance between the Arab countries and also support Israel in terms of the political scene? Well, the first thing I will tell you is that, uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of members of Congress wrote letters. You know, our freshman class signed a letter in support of Israel. So I think, and also a lot of the American people said up uh, their discontent about that. And so I think that caused the Obama administration to back away from, uh, you know, going pursuing, being the first time that the United States and the administration would have ever come out uh, to uh, sign on to a sanction against, uh, against Israel. And another thing that you have to look at with the Arab-Israeli relationships, um, you know, this is not about the Palestinians, okay? You must understand what is the real goal of the objective. And, and once again, go back to history and study. You know, where did the word Palestine come from? Okay. It came back, back in the year 73 AD, when the Romans conquered the land of Judea, and Emperor Hadrian, in order to kind of smack the Jewish people down, he said, we will change the name from Judea to Palestinian. And that's where that name came from. It has nothing to do with an Arab people. But yet, over time, we have allowed them to dominate that dialogue, really. So, and even after World War I, all people who lived in that region, be it a Jew, Arab, whoever, their passport said Palestine. So you have to understand what is the real goal and objective to have it. You know, the Jewish people in, in Palestine, that has just become a, a rallying problem. But when you have Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who stands there in Lebanon, looks down to, to, uh, to Israel and says, we are committed to the destruction of the Zionist people. When you have a, you know, Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, who in their charter, it states, we are committed to the destruction of Israel. If we allow the destruction of Israel, what's it that, what does that say about us? What does that say about the American cause when you have the only country in the Middle East that believed in that American spirit, that American cause, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, those things that we stand for and we believe in? Never forget that the first country to recognize the modern state of Israel in May of 1948, after 16 minutes, was the United States of America. 
And remember, I say the modern state of Israel. Israel has existed for 5,771 years. So we must understand that aspect of the dialogue. So uh, if we turn our backs on Israel, we're next. It's the bottom line. Yes, sir. Congressman, um, in the spirit of liberty and pursuit of happiness, you recently uh, voted to extend the certain uh, sure. portions of the Three Patriot. provisions of the Patriot Act. Um, I, I was told that you gave a, a pretty good uh, rationale on that, and I mm -hmm. unfortunately I wasn't able to attend that, that, that meeting. But uh, if, if you could, maybe. Sure. There, there are three provisions of the Patriot Act that came up to be extended, and I voted for those to be extended. And right now they have a 90-day extension. And it's the library provision, it's the roving wiretap, and it's the lone wolf provision. And this is what I told people is, and, and Joyce and I had a great discussion about this. At the end of the day, I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, you know, the most important civil liberty of the American people is their life. And if I vote to, 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 that could possibly give our enemy an advantage and a gap to exploit us by, and something happens, I mean, that's going to gut me. And when I look at the library provision, the, the reason why we have the library provision is because of what Muhammad Atta did uh, not too long ago, 10 years ago, down here, when he went to the libraries down in Broward County. And of course, he uh, arranged to buy the tickets for those 9 11 conspirators. The wire, the road and wiretap, is because these guys are very adaptive, they're very smart. They don't use the same device each and every time. They'll use this device and they'll go use another device and they'll go use the that device and then they'll use that device. And the thing is, if we don't have the roving wiretap provision, then you have to go and get a warrant for each and every single device instead of being able to track the individual. The lone wolf <coughs> provision is very simple. Major Nadal Hassan. Carlos Bledsoe. Who knows who Carlos Bledsoe is? See, this is, this is what happens. How soon we forget. Carlos Blesso was a young black guy from Memphis, Tennessee, who somehow traveled over to Somalia and then to Yemen, got terrorist training, came back to the United States of America and shot two U.S. soldiers at a Little Rock recruiting station. But you know what? No one talks about it. No one, no one says it was an, an act of jihadism, radical Islamism, terrorism. No one talks about that. See, I am very fearful that if we allow this enemy that much of a gap, he will once again exploit us. Now, yes, I don't want to see the liberties and the freedoms of law-abiding American citizens to be abused. And I will stand head and toe to make sure that that does not happen. But even more so, I believe that the most important thing that the federal government must do for you is protect you. And we didn't do a darn good job of that 10 years ago. And uh, we didn't do a darn good job of that a couple of years ago in Fort Hood, Texas. And I'm telling you, they're out there and they're waiting because we're not doing a darn good job of it in securing our war. And there are bad guys coming across our side. So in 90 days, we'll reevaluate that. I'm going to sit down, I'm going to talk to people. And uh, if, if there is really a concern about a constitutional infringement on law by American citizens, I may not support it, but I tell you what, I would be very nervous every night in case something does happen, because I do not want to see another repeat of that very terrible day that we had 10 years ago. And, and, and understand this, as we are in this fight, don't think like America. You better think like them. Okay. <laughs> How many people remember what happened in Mumbai, India? <clears throat> Don't ever believe that that exact same template could not happen in Fort Lauderdale. That someone could get a boat, come ashore, and go right up A1A, and in five to six hours, how many people end up losing their lives? Don't ever think that what happened to those children over Beslan could not happen in the United States of America. Because if you try to believe 
that these individuals have the same type of Western mindset, then you're going to find yourselves six feet up and you're going to find your country in the world turmoil. Yes, sir? Let's go down the West. I'm very happy to be calling you my congressman. Uh, I'm honored to be a representative. for you, and I voted for you, and I'm happy to call you that. Uh, that brings me to a question. I'm glad we got along the subject here. There are currently over 36 documented terrorist, terrorist training facilities here in the U.S. Yes. set up by Muslims of America. Um, they were uncovered by the Christian Action Network. Is Congress aware of these terrorist training camps, or what are they doing about it? Why are they allowed to exist? I will tell you why things like that are allowed to exist because when I gave the, uh, the little CPAC speech, political correctness has no part in our national security strategy. And, and this is an example of people being able to take. <laughs> that guy is either really happy or really sad. <laughs> but when you look at the fact that. You know, what's the first thing that people will come back and say? You know, we're exercising our freedom of religion. You know, Islam heard. I mean, there's documented proof of Islam heard. There's a big problem in the Northern Virginia corridor where, you know, Alawi was operating out of. Even in my home state of Georgia, there are two of these, uh, these training camps. And so I think there's a recalcitrance uh, at the senior levels of leadership in this country to deal with. It. You know, when, when all of a sudden, Combat operations are redefined as overseas contingency operations. When all of a sudden terrorist acts are now called man-caused disasters. When all of a sudden you have the Attorney General of the United States of America, who is in charge of you know, protecting the American people, and he can't even say the words radical Islamism or jihadism. When you look at our national security strategy, ladies and gentlemen, there are more mentions about global warming in the national security strategy than it is about radical Islamism. <laughs> So, you know, there's a very simple thing. The reality of your enemy will eventually become your own. And the longer that we try to push this thing off, we're just setting ourselves up for a cataclysmic event. And, uh, you know, uh, Peter King, the Representative Peter King of New York, who is now the chairman of the Homeland uh, Security Committee, I mean, he's going to have these, uh, you know, investigations on domestic uh, homegrown terrorism, things of that nature. Well, he had all these lists of individuals that he wanted to, you know, have uh, interviewed. And some very good people that understand this mindset, Stephen Coughlin, Steve Emerson, uh, Robert Spencer, and guess what? Certain groups put pressure on him, and you know, this person's not going to testify, and that person's not going to testify. And I'm sure you guys have seen the, the little video which happened in Pompano Beach a couple of nights ago. And uh, I, gotta tell you, I ain't bad at that. You know, I'm just not. But you do have, at the highest levels of leadership in this country, people that aren't willing to stand up and face this issue. And uh, as I said, we can ill afford to have a repeat of a sort of never changing moment in the United States of America. Yeah. We cannot. I'll start right um, Carl, um, Based on that, I wanted to ask you this. So it's kind of two questions. One, um, and I go through this a lot in the school here, and I might not phrase it very artfully, but um, it seems that if you argue a lot of times uh, that you want to protect the border, you're anti immigration or anti Hispanic. If um, you don't think there should be a mosque at Ground Zero, it's a bad idea. You're anti Islamic or Islamophobic. It seems like a lot of things have become so watered down and politically correct, you kind of said there, were, that, you know, with a president who can't say terrorism and just speaks in abstract nouns, whether it's the military not fighting to win, is it going to take something even worse than what's happened to get past that? And I know you don't have a problem with saying what you mean. Are you going to continue to do it no matter what you It's too late now. I've already said it. We continue to do it. If I tell you back, then y'all beat me up. <laughs> I'm speaking, I'm speaking facts. Right. And so, you know, the That's thing, that everyone always asks me, you know, what's the one thing that, that has really disturbed you in your time that you've been up in Washington, D.C.? And I tell you this very simple thing. Truth is subjective when you cross the tongue. That's a scary premise. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
No, I'm, I'm not a, a, you know, because you talk about securing your borders, which is one of the basic things about a republic. If you don't secure your border, how can you be a republic? Go back and look at history. Rome didn't secure his northern border. You know, you saw what happened. Yeah. It's illegal immigration. It's not that you're against immigration. You're not against a certain group of people. You know, there's all kinds of people that are coming to the United States of America. Go to the United States Border Patrol website and look up the category called OTMs. And, and back two to three years ago, I was talking about this thing called OTM. And even George said, what the hell are you talking about OTMs? What does that mean? It means other than Mexicans. And these are all the people that are coming to the United States, Somalia, Middle East, and we're losing track of them. I mean, you know, you've got an Eastern European illegal immigration problem down in mind today, which affects local criminality, this thing affects your health care, affects your education, affects your economy, and affects your national security. See, when people get to the point where they're calling you names, you got them. Okay? <laughs> and just, you know, just just bear down, but you got them. And when people call you an Islamophobe, or this a phobe, or that a phobe, just, you know, break it down like this. Tell them, you know, that the, the word comes from the Greek root word of uh, phobos, which means that you have a fear of the unknown. I don't have a fear of the unknown. If I know who a person is or I know what the situation is and I'm talking about a viable solution, that's not a fear. That's really me recognizing the problem. Don't allow people, you know, this is the other thing. You know, you're racist. How many times do we hear people call Tea Party what you're racist? I mean, they were calling Tea Party folks racist when I was at the rallies. <laughs> It has nothing to do with race, but that is a means by which people try to get you, you know, within your own skin to be uncomfortable, because nobody wants to be called racist. But let me tell you what you got to do. You got to fight through that, because if you allow them to say that and shut you down, then so. <coughs> Who was the keynote speaker at CPAC this year? You, you were. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, they had a permanent tank. <laughs> <laughs> That's the power of who we are. That's the power of the American cause. The American cause, this idea, this spirit, is for everyone. See, let me dovetail to something else. Where we are in America is not about Republican and Democratic. It is really about the philosophies and principles of governance that are the best for this country, that enabled America to be what it is in 234 years. Now, there is a camp that believes that America, as I say, must become a bureaucratic nanny state, must become this overarching great entity called government, which has so many fantastic powers. But remember, as Jefferson said, a government that is big enough to give you everything that you want is also big enough to take it all away. And that's what we have to be careful of. Because if, if we believe on that side over here of a large government, an overpowering government, if we believe in what you see in Wisconsin, this unionized entitlement class, then we will break the back of this country. But really, who we are in that American cause is about believing in your indomitable entrepreneurial spirit. If we're going to heal this economy, we've got to turn it back over down to your level, to the small business owner. Investment, ingenuity, and innovation are not terms of the government. They are terms that come from the American people. And that's what we must do. And there, right now, is a serious battle, an ideological battle in this country. And that's why you see such vile action. That's why you see such real, you know, viral name calling, things of this nature. Because for quite some time, people have been waiting for this opportunity that they got in 2008. And they really thought that you guys were going to lay down and take it. They did. They thought the American people were just going to let, hey, steamroll. But you stood up. How dare you? How dare you, you know, how, how dare you not like, you know, more bailouts? How dare you not like, you know, uh, nationalizing the production? How dare you not like cap and trace? How dare you not like the health care loan? But you're standing up. Now, this is what they do believe. Many people scratched their heads when Nancy Pelosi became the minority leader. <laughs> I didn't. But they don't believe that you're going to sustain this. They believe that this is just a blip on the radar screen. And they believe that in 2012, that that machine will come right back out, and they'll be right back on track. So this is the challenge to each and every one of you. 
you got to understand this ideological battle that we're in in this country because it really is about this American cause. It really is about the future and legacy of America. It really is about honoring the commitment, the oath, the great thing that the founding fathers established for us to have in the United States of America. Because if it's lost, remember that lighthouse that I was talking about? That light goes out, there's going to be a whole lot of ships that are going to be crashing on the rocks. And see, right now, that light is getting a little bit dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And that's why you see a lot of craziness going on in the world. But there are ships that are starting to crash on the rocks. Yes, ma'am. Pleasure meeting you. Uh, <laughs> my question is simple. Uh, any hopes in the future? Me? <laughs> hey, look, I, you know, I'm from Georgia. I'm at the University of Tennessee. You know, I'm, you know, I'm learning English. You know. <laughs> uh, and, and let me tell you something. And, and, you know, there's a whole lot of talk out there about certain things. The key thing about conservatism, we don't believe in a cult of personality. You know, I don't need to be writing books right now. I need to be writing legislation. I need to be doing the things to get our economic uh, shift back in order. I need to be doing the things to make sure we protect the American people and national security. It's not about vote right. You know, sometime later on down the road, when I'm retired and I'm wearing the Bermuda shorts with the black socks and the dress shoes. Yes, um, going back kind of the formulations, not to stay too much on it, but in regards to that American cause and ideal and extending that ideal um, outside of our borders, um, do you think it's realistically possible for our way of life and our mindset to ever peacefully coexist with that Islamic? Mindset, because my general understanding, sorry, is, is no. that it, it literally the religions do not are not made to exist. Well, you have to go back and you have to really study the, the varying phases of, of Islam. Uh, Islam was first begun in about 610 AD by, by Muhammad, and really the whole reason for establishing Islam because there were two dominant religions or faith beliefs at the time, and that was uh, Judaism and Christianity. Now the thing is, Judaism and Christianity led to a, an economic bond. I mean, because like-believing people traded and, and did commerce with each other. So what Muhammad believed, I could come up with this new thing, and maybe people, you know, we could, we could come together and we could establish ourselves as well. And, and that's why, if you go and study Greece, yeah, it's competition. I mean, Khadijah, his first wife, was a very successful uh, female trader. So uh, that's how that came about. But as he was not able to persuade people to really believe in this, then in about 622 AD, he did this thing called the Hijra, which is when he left Mecca, he went out to Medina, and that's when it had the second phase, which kicked off with a the thing called the Nakla raid and became very violent. It became a means by which you control people through rewarding them for violent actions. So, you know, there is a dualism in Islam, and there's this thing called Nakish, that's the Arabic phrase, which means abrogation, which means the later versions of the Quran supersede the previous versions, but yet they're all still word from God, so you can't argue with any of them. So I can sit up here and, and say one thing, and I can say another thing, and I'm still right. And so it's, it's very confusing. Now, this is what I would tell you. There are young people in the Islamic world that don't want the rule of the mullahs, the clerics, and the imams anymore. You know, one of the things that I saw when I was over in Afghanistan, the interpreters and translators, they would just sit on the instrument because they had a thirst for knowledge. I had a, a, an interpreter his entire life. He had never been outside of Kandahar. When he went to Kabul, he thought he was in New York City. <laughs> I mean, it was just overbearing. I mean, he, he was scared because he saw, you know, like cars and people and things. And it really did, you know, freak him out. That young man now has a green card that I helped him to get. And he has come over and he's, you know, working here in the United States of America. That's how you have to break it down. But you have to believe in who you are and your principles. You have to first, the information operation war, the propaganda is so important. Because when you fight against movements like this, Words can be more important than bullets in, in some way. Mm -hmm. So that's what you have to be able to do. There, you know, the, the, the average age of the Iranian citizen is somewhere between like 25 and like 32. They're young. They, they don't, they're Persian, first of all. 
they don't really want to continue on this. I mean, the Persian Empire was a great empire. It was once again conquered by the marauding Muslim armies. The Kurdish people, Jalal Talabani's son, who, you know, Jalal Talabani, the president of, uh, of Kurdistan, his son, he sat down and had a great conversation up there in my office in Washington, D.C. about that. And they want to have America engaged. They want to have economic exchange. They want America to believe in that one place that is really a thriving, stable place. And they are staunch allies of Israel. So there is an opportunity. But if we're not careful, we'll lose it. So uh, there is an ability to coexist. But if they hold on to the principle of that or the antithesis of who we are as a constitutional republic, we can't. Okay, question on this side. Uh, I just want to say, uh, my cousin, he's a private first class Alexander Ray Warren, uh, he's serving out right now in uh, Fort Lewis. He was given the uh, 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 military intelligence over there. But uh, he was going to be deployed out to Afghanistan. I guess orders changed, and then he was told to do a landscaping job. Uh, this was almost just a week ago. Uh, and then they switched orders again. And this was actually following he got the best marketship award in his company. So he's really distressed about having to do landscaping. But now they, he was given orders again, and he will be deployed in, in Kabul. Uh, my question to you is, uh, how do you see how things are happening over there? Maybe I can tell my family that, you know, it's good for him to be, you know, over there because the, the generals and uh, the other lieutenant colonels are actually taking care of the situation and have some good direction. So. Well, I think the most, and, and please uh, give him my regards and thank you for uh, serving. I think the most important thing, you know, the United States of America never loses a tactical level. For the soldiers, sailors, airmen, or reason fighting, we always lose a strategic level because we don't have good goals and objectives. When you look at the fact that we are over in Afghanistan now, with 10, 11 years, we're still fighting combat operations, it's because we took our eye off the ball. You know, the mission of the United States military is not nation building and occupational warfare in these type of areas. It's just going to drain resources, which comes back to your economy. Once again, something they're very willing to do. So you got to deny this enemy sanctuary. You got to find him. You got to fix him in position so he can't re. Uh, re move around, you've got to bring all of your available weapon systems to bear on him, you have to destroy him in place, you've got to pursue him. There are certain places in the world that's all they understand. It's strength and might. You know, that's a very tribal culture over there. You know, you can go out and do all the nice things and, and what have you. And, and I'll give you a great example. You come in during the day. I spent two and a half years in Afghanistan. You come in during the day, you, you, you bring in all the nice stuff for the for <coughs> and for schools and what have you. But if you don't stay, who comes in in the night? And when they come in at night, then they threaten If you continue to do this, we'll kill you. You know, when the tribal chief comes up to you and says, you know, Colonel West, that guy, that guy, and that guy over there, the Taliban, what does the tribal chief expect the Colonel West to do? Protection. Kill him. <laughs> <laughs> the tribal chief is not expecting you to go sit down and have, you know, pistachios and, and green tea. <laughs> and say, you know, well, what really are your concerns? You know, uh, you know, are are you really, you know, doing well? Are you doing? And then you let them go, because those three guys are gonna say, "Who ratted me out?" And then the next thing you know, the tribal chief ends up with his head in his lap, or the school teacher gets beheaded in front of his students. You know, there's a, a thing going on in Afghanistan called the Catch and Release Program, where a, a tribal leader or a father can come and present a letter to a detainment facility, and we release these people back out to them. But yet, we are imprisoning our own warriors of killing the enemy. So what type of mindset does that put into our young soldiers? When we tell our young soldiers, sailors, airmen, and coast guardsmen in these combat zones of operation that you can't fire them until you fire upon them. I've been in a couple of firefights. In about three seconds, people start dying. And I hate to tell you, that was the exact same thing that that naval warship was told. Do not fire unless you see some type of intimate danger. And so they just followed that ship until the point when the Somali pirates shot an RPG at the naval ship and then they executed those members. Our rules of engagement are out of whack. So we have to once again have leaders in combat that understand the mentality of the enemy that they're facing. And I'll tell you something else, Pakistan, not our friends. Saudi Arabia, not our friends. We have to start recognizing who's on our side. 
you know, we had a good discussion the other night at Palm Grove Beach about, you know, Mubarak. If you continue to elevate and support these dictators, despots, theocrats, and autocrats, I mean, eventually, I mean, they're going to turn it on. Or you're going to see what happened where $70 billion, where the taxpayer dollars have just gone down the drain in Egypt. So we've got to be a little bit more frugal. Robert Mugabe is another great example in Africa. So we've got to do better as far as recognizing, you know, who's on the other side. Really. All right, I'll come back over this subject. So what, what kind of advice can you give us as to what to do? I, I like you, I'm very worried about the future of our country, and I feel that uh, the liberals are so organized, and the, the media, they've got the media, and the administration, and everything else. What can we do? I mean, I personally joined the Tea Party. I helped in, in your campaign. This is not an election year, though. So what Ah, uh, see, can that's, do? that's the thing. You know, it may not be an election year, but this is the time when you're preparing. This is the time when you're training. This is the time when you're getting ready. And you know, when you just said, Julie, you know, they have the media. Everybody here, they have a cell phone raised up. Everybody has cell phone raised up. Come on, put the cell phone up. You got cell phone? Okay? Now, with your other hand, if you do have your own iPad or personal laptop computer, raise your other hand. Yeah? Yeah? So guess what? Every single one of you is a media source. Mm -hmm. So stop with excuses. Okay? You have the opportunity to get a message out. Now this is the thing that you must do. You can't lay off. You can't go dancing in the end zone. You know, that's one of the great things that Coach Lou Holt said. Act like you've been there. You had a great victory in November 29th. That ain't it. There's a great battle that's coming in November 2012. And if you lose that battle, it doesn't matter what you have done in November 2010. So what you must start doing now is start preparing. You need to be out there training up. Who, who's the next generation of leaders down here in South Florida? Who are you going to raise up at the local level, city council level, mayor, mayor races, school boards, county commission, state representatives, state senators? Who are, the, who are those next people? That's where we do a poor job. What do we do? I mean, the Republican Party did not recruit me. Someone came to me and I said, okay, I'll do it. But we have to do better. I mean, and I'm not staying up there for any 20, 30, or whatever years. You got about six to eight years of me. That's it. I'm coming home. You know, I'm tired. I want to chill out. I want to scuba dive. I want to ride my motorcycle. I want to enjoy my life. I want to be part of this, you know, great America that I've been protecting. But the onus on me is what? Who do I hand the baton to? That's what has to happen. There's some young man, there's some young woman out there that has to be ready, that we've got to train to get ready in the wings. That's what you need to be doing. You know, it's, it's just the same in the military. You know, you want a skirmish. There's a bigger battle with wounds. And in between, you've got to continue to recon, you've got to continue to patrol, you got to continue to build up your strength, you got to continue to assess the strength of your adversary so that you can be ready for that decisive battle becomes in November 2012. Removed. That's what they don't get to I'll come to this side and I'll come back here. Like, uh, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's a treat to... Uh, uh, it's not a treat. Uh, uh, Somebody is going to buy me like a chicken place. Like Dr. DeRosa, I was also intrigued by your comment that uh, the geopolitical situation uh, is going to look very different uh, uh, around the world 90 days from now. I'm wondering, do you see any role um, as far as the U.S. State Department in terms of going to these places where, um, in the case of Libya, where there has been um, uh, a dictator, Gaddafi, for the past four decades? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that there's any role um, in the U.S. that the U.S. should play in terms of um, exposing people who have not been exposed to IE, um <coughs> the checks and balances kind of system, the three branches of government. Do you believe that there's any educational role that the United States has? Well, th this, this is what I think the United States role has to be. The United States role has to be very forthright in not allowing the wrong actors to take over the, the, in these countries, in these situations. Uh, I'm very concerned about the uh, power of the Muslim 
Muslim Brotherhood, you know, a lot of people want to say it, it has never been around. A lot of, once again, this recalcitrance to identify and understand. Muslim Brotherhood has been around since like 1926, 28, mm -hmm. Okay. You know, Saeed Qutub, who was, you know, the grandfather of Muslim Brotherhood, you know, was here in America. He studied here. I mean, he was executed by NASA. The Muslim Brotherhood, you know, assassinated Anwar Sadat. The Muslim Brotherhood, Anwar Zawahiri, number two in Al Qaeda, is an Egyptian. He was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood spawned off all of these uh, many other uh, Islamic terrorist organizations, them along with Iran. So uh, that's my concern. You know, how do we get in there and make sure that they don't at the lower level? Everyone keeps talking about, ah, don't worry about Egypt because, you know, these generals who have been trained in the United States, they're going to be loyal. I don't care about the generals. I care about the folks down here at that level. You know, where you can get in and you start agitating the rank and file, and then that bubbles up, and then you see what happens. So I think the most important thing is that, you know, we've got to improve our intelligence gathering. You know, being in the CIA is a dirty little business. You know, Stansfield Turner and Jimmy Carter gutted our CIA, and you saw what were the ramifications of them doing that. You know, we, the fact that we did not see this series of cataclysmic events coming about, you know, 40 days ago, that's very unnerving. It really is. So I think that if we're going to do anything, we, we have got to make sure, we've got to make statements that the wrong actors, we will not allow, not allow support the wrong actors who take the uh, take the move in those countries. Yes? Hey, good to see you, Dr. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, before I get into my question, I just want to mention something about the Patriot Act. Um, just so you, you said in the future when it comes up, you're still kind of playing possibilities. This is just what I feel. I feel the Patriot Act in terms of the Fourth Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, I also feel that certain events hate this corpus, which we always have, which has allowed us to have a speedy trial. Um, I have a um, <coughs> clip, a newspaper, a uh, news channel clip in mind where a young guy was taken in under the Patriot Act. His mother didn't know where he was for <clears throat> about two months. So I mean, something like that just, you know, I think habeas corpus is an important right that we have to have a charge on us to be able to do a speedy trial. Um, I also understand from experts that 99% of Americans do not fit the profile and criteria of the terrorists. So I wonder why are we focusing on Americans when we have 3,000, 8,000 illegals that are crossing on the border I, I agree. and potential terrorists. So, so I, I think, in, in my opinion, one of the quotes I want to give you is Ben Franklin once said, Oh, I know. If you sacrifice your liberties for security, you will end up. You know, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to write books, but I do know how to read. <laughs> I, um, I'm a lot about battles here. I am. Um, let, let, me, let, me, let me go first to the picture I think, you know, and my chief of staff back there. What we're going to do is, you know, I'm going to sit down and my staff is going to research every violation, if it's out there. I mean, we're going to contact the Department of Homeland Security, and every violation of American citizen uh, based upon the picture. And I want to get that empirical data, and uh, I want to do that research. But uh, like I said, you know, at the end of the day, um, I want to make sure that I protect the American people. And back in November, when I uh, had the great opportunity to be on Meet the Press, and David Gregory asked me about profile, I told him right there, there's no such thing as profile. It's called trend analysis. And we're wasting our resources chasing after Americans and grandmas going to you know, airline security. Angels, 
I think it's point number eight or nine is to establish a centralized bank. So I do have concerns about the, the payment. So okay. we're trying. If it ever comes up through the Financial Services Committee and it makes it through that committee, it gets on the House floor and gets on the way. I appreciate it. Congressman, I don't know how, much, how many more questions do you want to uh, field? It's your problem. Okay. Four more. Okay. <laughs> okay, hold on. I, now I have on this side, so I'll go back to the gentleman back here. He's got a great flat top. Colonel Wise, a couple tours in Vietnam. I'd love to see Thanks for all of us. Talk about rules and engagement stories with you. Yeah. Uh, I'm very concerned seeing these 13 month tours of our young men. Oh, uh, I, let me tell you what I Is there anything we can do to make yeah, it? Let, let me tell you what I believe, because you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, 12, 13 month tours and these types of combat zones are not good. And the other thing that I don't like is uh, when you tell someone that you're going to take them out of the combat zone and let them come back home for 30 days, that's tough. When you talk about playing mental you know, hopscotch with someone, because all of a sudden you're telling me to you know, take myself out of this very volatile environment and then come back home and sit down with you know, my husband and my wife and my kids and try to have some sense of normality for three weeks, then what do you think is going to start happening in the last week? Then I've got to start trying to switch gears because then you want me to go back over here into this aspect. And how long is it going to take me to get spun back up? So I think that when we look at the effectiveness of the American combat troop on the ground, uh, those tours of duty need to be six to eight months and it continues. Because uh, you know, most times you will see if you study deployments, and you will know, casualties happen primarily in those last 30 to 45 days. When guys start to get that, you know, deer in the headlights and they start to get very tentative, you know, I don't want to go out there, and the next thing you know something bad happens. So I think we need to reduce that to six to eight months. But let me tell you what that comes back to. I mean, when the Soviet Union collapsed, who became the bill payer in the United States of America? Remember what I talked about? You know, the American cause, how we really don't always want to go out there and we put, you know, Pax Americana or anything. What do we always do? We always draw down the military. And all of a sudden, we've got to try to ramp it back up and catch up. And that's what we're doing now. When you've got Back in 1990, the United States Army had 75 combat brigades. The United States Army now is down to 45 combat brigades. So now you've got young men and young women, five <coughs> tours. That's hell. And, and, and you're right. I mean, just back and forth. I mean, I, I will tell you, you know, that you know, you get very, and you and I share this very loud noises. You know, you're really paying attention to people that are following, you know, really close behind you. You know, in, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, you're driving along a, a, a highway, you see a big pile of trash. Is there really a big pile of trash? Is there an IED under there? You see this dead lamb. Is there really a dead lamb? Is there a bomb stuck, stuck inside? So, I mean, we've got to the dwell time. You know, for that period that you're deployed, we need to at least get two years, maybe three years, okay, where we allow our, our, our men and women to come back home. This is the problem with the United States of America. We have based the defense of our nation on budgets, on numbers, not on the Bible threats. We really do need to do a threat assessment. And, and I will tell you, what I saw, and, and I will share this one thing, because this is not classified, but there is a threat coming out of uh, Latin America with these many submersibles, one or two man submersibles, which are highly technical, able to, you know, go under, not, not easily to, uh, to detect good communication systems. Right now they're running drugs. What could they run in the future? So those are the types of things we really have to concern about. Yes, sir. Uh, what is the chances of the United States adopting Israeli airport security procedures? <laughs> we missed the window of doing that after 9-11. You know, I, I got to tell you that when I flew over to Israel, uh, I didn't have to take my shoes off. I went through with a bottle of water, I mean, and I was just as safe as I could be. But when I came back over, and I landed in, uh, in New Jersey, and my wife, Angela Tate, I bought her this real nice thing of, like, uh, Dead Sea, you know, body salts and, and lotions and stuff. And the dude took it and dumped it out in front of me. I showed him the receipt. I said, I just bought it. 
I said, look, here's my ID card. I'm going to retire to the car. He's like, I ain't in your ID card. It does involve your economy. 
It involves energy independence. And they, all these things, it trade, but all these things tie right back to your national security. Remember that final E in the dime theory, economic. And I would even say, make a hyphen and put another E, energy. Energy resourcing is a key to the success and the future of this country. And we have resources here, but for whatever reason, we won't develop it. And I'll tell you why. Because you have an agency called the EPA that is nothing but a draconian regulatory agency now. It is not offering up solutions, but it is trying to do behavior modification through regulation. You know, when I sat there at the State of the Union address, and the President kept talking green energy, green energy, green energy, green energy, solar and wind is only going to get you 7 to 8 percent. That's it. It's a great thing. But here in Florida, we could be a leading tech, you know, a leading uh, entity in energy technology. Limited oil exploration off our coast. Natural gas, the biofuels from over here in the glades, and then also solar. So that we can start producing, consuming, and maybe even exporting the energy resources we have here in the United States of America. And that is how we're going to send a message to the enemies of this state. Right now, we're not. I'm going to close on this. Always remember that the American cause is further only when America is strong. If America is weak, if the light is dimming on that lighthouse, ships are going to start crashing into the rocks. And eventually, this great experiment and the freedoms and liberties of the individual are going to collapse. So God bless you all.